everyone, welcome to Studio Sunday. We hope everybody is happy and healthy, enjoying the fall weather. Absolutely. We certainly are. Yes. We actually had the windows open and the AC off for a few hours this week. Yeah. I forgot I what it sounded like outside with no ACs going. Oh, that was so wild. It was so quiet, just hearing the planet and no machines. I'm hoping that wasn't our fall. <laughs> <laughs> well, the one eight day. hours. <laughs> that we have. And now we hear the kids outside. Yeah, it's fun. Yeah. Okay, serial number eight is at the printer and will be in stores in mid-November and Terry's already on serial number nine. Yes. Yes. Plowing along. <laughs> and um, the eight hands off to nine really well, so it's a lot like one book to me. Well, it is one book. Yeah, it will read as one. Well, that's very interesting. That's very how, funny how that works out. <laughs> You're getting down to it. Yes. The series will be finished in January, and we'll have a second trade, Cat and Mass Sound. Cat and Mass? Cat and Mass. Oh, I like that word. Yeah. Cat and Mouse out in February with the hardcover and softcover omnibus coming in March. So we've got everybody covered. If you collect the issues, you can have them. If you collect the trades, you can have them. The softcover omnibus, the hardcover omnibus. And we will be doing a limited edition abstract studio version omnibus. And it will go on pre-sale in early December for shipping in late March. So watch out for those and um, there's we'll something be, for everybody. We'll be moving ahead. Yeah, that's wild. To your next big project. Yee! <laughs> <laughs> oh, I just felt the adrenaline run through me. The okay, next well, project. Well, that's all I've got. Do you have anything to add, Mr. Moore? Um, it's been a very uh, intense time working on the book, and I really missed uh, everybody not going to New York Comic Con and Baltimore Comic Con. So Baltimore Comic Con is happening this weekend. Right now. Yeah. So as we speak, uh, people are walking the convention center and looking at art, and that's how fun is that? It's just great. Maybe next year. Maybe next year. Yeah. Looking forward to it. Okay. Well, are you ready to get on the hot seat? Sure. Okay. I've got two questions, two interesting questions, I think. The first one is, as an artist, how much are you affected by praise or criticism of your work? Let me answer that one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think Robin speaks for all of us here. <laughs> he takes it very personally, folks. The criticism. Yeah. Because it's your baby, you know, you're, you're trying. It's not like, you know, you just put together something from the store. You know, you just kind of pour your heart in. It's like writing a song and playing it and nobody liked it. It's like that. Well, so you do take it very personally. Yeah. Um, does it affect the way you go forward? Do you change according to how what people are saying about your work? Um, no, I don't. And actually, um, when it comes to the work, the I have a kind of a... I have a thin skin as a creator, of course, but I have a thick skin for the work. So if I feel like the work is not measuring up, I try harder. I, I actually makes me much more intense, like, like a com competition, competitive nature comes out and it makes me work harder, try harder. Um, but do I become a head case for criticism? No. Sometimes. Really? <laughs> There have been times where I've been really mad at the criticism I got, but like I didn't think, well, I don't agree and you're just being nasty. There was one time I told a guy to stop reading my book because he kept, he sent me a critical letter every issue. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he was just trying to help you. No, he was snarky. Oh, yeah. So he would take my lines in the book and throw them back at me. You just have to let those go. Yeah, you just have to let it but go. But see, he takes it personally, folks. <laughs> Okay, the next question. I would like to know your thoughts on pencil and paper compared to computer-generated art. I think pencil and paper, um, I think it, 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 it requires a different part of your brain than digital art. Digital art is so quick to um, change, redo, change, redo. Whereas pencil and paper, um, you actually sort of commit to getting that that lead on the paper, and it's hard to get the lead off sometimes. You have to; it takes care and technique to be able to pencil light enough so that you can erase it. 
and don't leave a lot of dark shadows where you were unless you don't care and that's going to be part of it. So it's, it's like the difference between building a violin in, in your shop or designing a violin on your computer. It's that difference. There's a lot of manual technique and I think because you have it in your hands, you begin to feel more uh, connected to it. Whereas on the computer, you're just going for perfection. Uh, and I'm just gonna keep redoing that layer until I get it perfect. And why have you never kind of jumped into the digital art scene? I really think, you know, we have a Wacom tablet and, and the big computer and Photoshop and all that. I really think it's because I really love the, to have that paper in my hand. What I first loved about comics was actually having the art in my hand that I had drawn. Um, and if I work mainly on computer, what I have is a JPEG, a printout, and um, which has, you know, it's, ha it's two different paths. Yeah. These trees can live side by side, but they grow in two different ways, you know. Um, they're both extremely useful. Digital is very useful. Uh, it really has a place in the world. But I just love having that. I, I like making the real the thing. The tactile part of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It feels like an accomplishment when I get a page made. Uh, and you'll, you've seen it before that we keep all of the original art right here next to the drawing table. And I like having it there, you know. So I don't. It's in my way. It constantly. is in the way. <laughs> and every time I have to move it, I feel like a, a, a Greek story where I made something and now I have to carry it the rest of my life. So yeah, I see you have Echo on your drawing table here. Yeah, I was thinking about drawing tools and all that. If you look through one of my books, they kind of look like they all use the same drawing tool, inking tool. But it actually takes three different inking tools to make a book. Um, you already said all that. Yeah, but I think we're probably going to cut what? it out. <laughs> <laughs> so it, because I don't use digital, I have my different brush tips here. And I see a lot of people use one or the other or just that, and I use all three uh, on one page. And I was going to show you how I do that and what the difference is. Good. Also, we do have Echo hardcovers available on the website now. Yes, we do. And that's why this one is sitting here, because I love this book. Okay, well, that's it for me. I'm going to go pack. I'm taking a quick trip to Chicago. Did you know that? What are you going to see in Chicago? I'm going to go to the Banksy exhibit. I'm a huge Banksy fan. I think the guy is a genius. And um, so I'm going to run up there and see that exhibit. Okay. I love this artist's work. And I love his aesthetic. And I love his uh, sensibility. So yeah, yeah he's, I, he's I just wonderful. think it's great. So, okay, you guys have a great week. And Terry will get on to his tutorial. Yeah, maybe here. Okay, so these are the inking uh, tools that I've been using my whole life. This is my favorite of all time, of course. This was the pen that we used in school. And everything I drew in school and after school was with a big pen. It was, you know, so cheap and readily available. And it feathers really well um, when you get on uh, paper. You can lift the pressure and it would go from uh, dark black to gray. So you see a lot of people with notebooks on Instagram, they will be using uh, a pen like this. A lot of times they're doing it with ballpoint pens and they'll draw beautiful landscapes. And then the modern version, which is this guy, um, you can get them in a super fine and then a regular medium. And uh, I see a lot of notebook, uh, people with notebook drawings love trees and things like that. Uh, I love finding those people on Instagram and they use these ballpoint pens and do magnificent tonal drawings. And of course, um, the most obvious comic book um, example we can think of is Frank Cho. Frank Cho uh, is also a master of the ballpoint pen. So uh, it, when I say also, I mean in, in deference to the notebook people that are on Instagram. There's a lot of them from Europe and South America that are doing fantastic illustrations in their notebooks. And I want to, I want to know what happens to those notebooks. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the other tool that I went to after that was when I um, took a Disney course. And the first thing they taught us was how to use a brush so that you could get 
the the classic line on the the type of animation and character drawing that they did, especially for their comic books. Um, so I learned how to use a brush when I was in my twenties, and I can show you. Um, you can see it in my all of my work. And then um, when I got into doing indie comics, I noticed that a lot of people were using this Hunt 102 pen. Um, it's cheap. It's fairly cheap. You get two for two dollars and twenty nine cents, and it has a uh, fine point, but it's fairly flexible. Um, I don't know how to split it. You can split it easily and get a thin to fat line, uh, whereas the other brushes may have longer uh, tines and they may split too fast, too easily, too broad. And the 102 just seemed to have a really good balance of thin to thick, um, but it's a hassle because you're dealing, you're putting ink on top of paper uh, like a swimming pool and you have to be careful where you put your hands. You have to work from left to right, top to bottom. Um, and of course, there's a problem with going around the backside of a circle or things like that. You're always having to plan your approach so that you're always pulling the pen. So this has limitations. Um, it also makes the drawing, uh, if you do the entire page with that, it's a lot of fine lines. So it's hard to get black contrast. Um, and then the thing that's so popular right now for all of us is the, uh, the felt pens. They've, come, they've gotten so good. You can get them in any size. And I use the Micron because it works best for me. But it could be, you know, whatever, whatever you're into, you know, whether you bought uh, the Copics or the Pit Pens or whatever, you know, they all work. But this is the one that I like the most. Um, it seems to always stay really black and the points uh, last longer than the others for me. And there's very little bleeding on this one. That's the big deal. If you hold one of the other ones to the paper and just let it sit there, there may be a little seepage and there's no seepage on this. And that's a pretty gross way to describe these. Makes me think of, you know, atomic radiation shut the town down. <laughs> but uh, these pins seem to be biologically safe. So there, okay. Um, so it's one thing to show you these. What does it look like on paper? Okay, here's some original art. Um, I use all, all of them on every page. Um, this is the big stuff right here. It's all brush. And if you can picture that when this is wet and has a fine point, all of this looks like it's brush size, doesn't it? The outline of this guy. But when you get into the details, like right here, See how everything is more, um, more balanced line. It doesn't go um, this broad, fat lines like this. That is this pen right here. And this pen is able to do both that little uh, highlight in the eye, but it also can, you pull enough pressure on it, you can get that broad stroke on the, on the nose. Then get these little dots right here, broad stroke, pull, 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 pull. Uh, and then here's where you don't put any pressure and it all just, that's what the natural line looks like. Um, so dot, dot, dot. All that is, all this in face right in here is from the pinpoint. And then when it was time to come out to the bigger, fatter lines, the bold lines, it went back, to, I went back to brush and got all this stuff in here. And the brush did these lines in here too. Because once you have it in your hand, you don't want to put it down. And the same thing, the brush did all these guys in here. You can see, <clears throat> excuse me, you can see how fluid they are. And then when it was time to do the background lines, pull this guy back in again, and you can see the line width. So can you look at this hand and tell which was which? Maybe now you can, huh? So that's how I do it. Um, the outside lines, it's so the the figure has so much more presence if it has a bold outside line, and then if you put the details on the inside uh, with one of these guys finer details, it just has a really nice contrast look. How does it look on the page? Um, that's a good question. So I'm bragging all about it, but does it look good on prints? Let's see. Where are you? Here you are. Original art versus print. And whereas on the original art, 
you can see my, uh, see my, especially if I angle it in the light, you can see the brush, uh, the ink weights change, uh, but on the final print, it all flattens out to a black. You can pretty much do whatever you want with these three tools right here. Uh, so, uh, if you want to see an example of how I draw with them, I'll, I'll record some and uh, let's see if it works. Okay, so three drawings, three different inking tools. Let's start with the Micron. And again, this could be whatever you bought, the Pit Pen or the uh, Copic, whatever. I tend to like Microns because I think they bleed less. Um, and this is just an 03. This is the same one that I used to do all my lettering with, just dialogue lettering. If you go on the side of the pen like that, on the edge of the tip, you can get that finer line like that. Um, it doesn't always have, you can see a, a line variation there depending on how much pressure you put on the pen um, and whether you're using the flat surface or the very edge. Because these do have a shape to them. You know, it's kind of a round squared, rounded off square shape to the tip. So you can work the flat part or the edge of it. And you just kind of get a feel for that as you go. The good thing about these guys is you can draw circles. You, you know, you can go all the way around without it catching or spitting ink or something, you know. Not the case with the dip pen. Okay, so there's the felt tip pen. Let's move on to this bad boy. So this is the Hot 102 pen. Dip pen's probably been around thousands and thousands of years. You'll notice that I uh, always have to pull it down, and if I want to go up, I have to change my hand. One cool thing about these pens is you can turn them upside down and get a, a finer line. So there's the basic line. Here it is upside down, and there's a, a little bit finer line there for you. You can use that to, you know, for your effects when you need that. You can already see the difference uh, in how I've approached the trees and the bushes uh, and have to work with this pen because it's all, it's a directional pen. It's a one-way pen. You can only go one direction with it, really. Kind of go a little bit off to the side. And it changes how things end up come, getting drawn. You know, if I can go all the way around, I get a much more round circle with the felt pen, but if I have to pull um, and do the head in two parts, the head has a different shape. I can get a circle with it, but I'm just going fast and default here, so that's just what comes out of my hand naturally. So there's the difference between those two. They're pretty close, aren't they? That's why so many people just don't bother with dip pens, and they just use the... Um, the felt pins. Okay, so a Raphael number one, 8404 brush with good sable. Um, again, it's a pull, a kind of a one-way uh, inking instrument, but it has a lot more flex, of course. And right now, it is totally loaded with ink. <laughs> Everything coming off that brush is fat, uh, every line. So I'm taking advantage of it to do these big bold lines. And um, when I first uh, was buying art supplies, ink was so expensive for me, um, I hated to waste that ink over there on the roll-off page that I have. But it ruined so many drawings to have my brush have too much ink on it. Um, I realized that I needed to do that. This guy encourages you to just keep going because it's much longer between uh, dipping to the inkwell than a pen. So you can really just make a lot of progress and that's probably why it's the mainstay. And it's so versatile that the, the differences between the lines on the, on the brush is amazing. You can go from uh, one to eight on a micron pen 
and do it all the same, all the same lines on with one brush. It's just a matter of getting used to it, and um, once you do, it's you know you, it becomes intuitive to use it, which is probably the same thing you could say with digital tablets. I think um, the lines have more arcs when I use a brush. So there you have it, the brush, the dip pen, and the micron.